this across cultures. And this one on system-based practice, fellows must demonstrate an awareness of and responsiveness to, again, you see that? Awareness of and responsive to the larger context and system of health care, including the social determinants of health, as well as the ability to call effectively on other resources to provide optimal health care. So how do we, how do we, we uh, help the uh, trainees to actually do this. And I would suggest that using these two tools can be a way of doing it. Now the roadmap, and I did um, send out a, uh, a handout packet which has uh, PDFs of my PowerPoints, as well as uh, sections from the DSM-5 that are referenced here, as well as backup material. Um, I, I, uh, that was uh, sent this morning and should be distributed to, to all of you. Um, so um, in the introduction to DSM-5, there are some sections on culture and gender. Uh, in the uh, disorder narrative sections of section two, for some of the diagnoses, we have culture-related diagnostic issues section and gender-related diagnostic issues section. I'll show you an example in a moment. Diagnostic criteria uh, changed in some diagnoses. I'll give you a quick example. And then the other conditions that may be a focus of clinical attention, the V codes. Then in section three, we have our two tools. And in the appendix, we have the glossary of cultural concepts of distress, which replaced the, glo the glossary of culture bound syndromes in appendix I of DSM uh, four, which uh, no longer exists that term no longer exists. So in the introduction, there's a, a description of culture and cultural identity. And in the big picture here, you can see in the uh, light blue is we're going beyond race ethnicity to involve a number of potential other cultural identity variables that the person um, might uh, might be part of, and especially the influence of the social network on the individual's illness experience. So again, um, moving from the idea of cultural identity as one cultural identity variable that is static and fixed, and that you can even know the person's cultural identity just by looking at them, you know, uh, that idea to one of understanding cultural identity as an intersection of race, ethnicity, age, gender, sexual orientation, religious and spiritual beliefs, socioeconomic status, um, political orientation, and other factors. So it's an intersection, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. And ultimately, we have to ask, not assume. So an example of culture related diagnostic issues sections, and I should say parenthetically here that the DSM-5 TR will be coming out next year. TR stands for tax revision, where there'll be updated sections on um, uh, of the culture related diagnostic issues. So uh, please, uh, be mindful of that. There'll be new information included in the TR related to these culture related diagnostic issue sections. So as you can see here, this is what was in DSM-4, repeated in DSM-5, that um, when cultural identities are different, we have to pay attention to these matters, that ideas that appear delusional in one culture may be commonly held in another. And, in some cultures, visual or auditory hallucinations with a religious content, such as hearing God's voice or normal part of religious experience. And then this, this sentence was added in DSM-5. Uh, the, the point of all of this is think of these sections as stop signs that ask you to ask, don't assume. So when you, at, when, you, when you ask a patient, do you hear voices? And the patient says, yes, I hear God's voice. Um, 
before you go down that track of saying, well, God's, you know, hearing a voice means auditory hallucination, means psychotic symptom, means a diagnosis of psychotic disorder or mood disorder with psychotic features, which means an antipsychotic medication. And we're all trained very well to do that. Before you go down that track is to ask, don't assume, well, can you tell me more? You know, where do you hear God's voice? So I hear it in church. I go to church, you know, every Sunday. Um, and uh, my family goes and we, you know, family members hear God's voice and so on. So uh, we may get the sense that that's related to the person's, uh, you know, belie religious beliefs, part of the cultural identity. But we need to ask more uh, because, uh, you know, well, uh, has anything changed? Uh, do you, what, what, what is God actually saying to you now? Well, in the last week, you know, I hear God's voice outside of church, and, and they're telling me to jump off the bridge. Well, then, then it moves over to, you know, something more psychopathological. So that's our job as psychiatrists, is to gather that information and to sort out, to make that discernment, that assessment. What is, what is cultural? What is psychopathological? And sometimes it's a combination of both. So this is our job, and this is what these sections help us to do. Now, for panic disorder, uh, the diagnostic criteria were actually changed. So this is just a minor example of uh, work of Devon Hinton at Harvard that pointed out that there are certain distressing experiences which are not, uh, should not be counted towards the criteria for panic disorder. Now, moving on to the V-code section, this is the introduction. Um, where we have uh, that these are conditions or problems that may be a focus of clinical attention and may be related to diagnosis, course prognosis, or treatment of a patient's mental disorder. And these uh, may be coded uh, as part of the diagnosis. Um, and that these are not mental disorders. These are not mental disorders. And that's why these are often forgotten, I think, because they're not mental disorders, they're not billable, so who cares about them? Um, but in fact, if you go back and take a look there, uh, these are the categories of these V codes. Under each of these categories, there are, there, there are many, there are many. And the ones that are um, in yellow, I, I'm just going to say a little bit more about some of them that are underneath them, okay? So for abuse and neglect, uh, well, before I get there, is I do believe these V codes do map onto many of the social determinants of mental health. Now, this is the diagram of Michael, Shem, uh, Michael Compton and Ruth Shem. They wrote a very important book of 2015 called The Social Determinants of Mental Health. They had nine. Here in their latest work, they have 16 um, social determinants of mental health. So for example, in the upper right corner is climate change. That's a new one they've added and exposure to air, water, or soil pollution. That's another one they've added. Um, and so I do believe some of, many of the V codes map right onto this. Now pertinent to uh, work in child and adolescent psychiatry, I think is in the lower left corner, adverse early child experiences and childhood maltreatment. Um, as well as many of these others. And also next to it is discrimination and social exclusion. I'll come back to that in a moment. So under that category of abuse and neglect, we have these specific V codes that again, I think map, um, that map right onto that social determinant of mental health. And this also touches into the accreditation standard for the uh, training programs that we, and I'm sure you evaluate this all the time, but I'm just giving you a method by which you can, um, that you can um, actually incorporate this into your diagnostic thinking in a more formal way. Um, and here is another uh, one that involves immigrants or refugees. 
Again, a patient may have a mental disorder and an acculturation difficulty. Now, this one I think is very relevant to what people may be experiencing these days. Patients may come in complaining of these sorts of things, and we need to um, uh, assess, don't assume, we need to assess uh, what this is about and that, in fact, uh, this may be a, uh, may rise to the level of a clinical concern that the patient has, that if you don't address it, if you just say, well, that's not part of a mental disorder diagnostic criteria, so who cares about this? Uh, well, that's not, that may lead to the patient feeling disrespected and drop out of treatment. Um, and here is yet, this is the last one I wanted to mention was religious or spiritual problem, which I helped to get into the DSM-4 25 years ago. Um, these are distressing experiences such as loss or questioning of faith um, or questioning of other spiritual values, uh, such as having a mystical experience or a dear, near death experience. And, and wondering, am I going crazy or not? And um, that these are not mental disorders, uh, that it's a, a non-psychopathological category of distress and experiences that uh, need to be seen in that way and, and, and addressed and treated in that way. Now, moving on to our, our two clinical tools, the outline for cultural formulation, of course, came out in Appendix I of the DSM-IV, um, and it's been one of my uh, career activities is to uh, spread the good news about this. Um, and so there are four uh, interrelated fields of information at the beginning, and the fifth part of the outline is often forgotten, and that is how do you bring it together for your differential diagnosis and treatment planning implications? So the uh, what's in yellow is DSM-5, what's in white is DSM-4. Um, it so these are fields of information that we ask the clinician to think about. What's the cultural identity of the individual, cultural concepts of distress, the stressors and supports in the person's life, the cultural features of the relationship between the individual and the clinician, and the uh, how does this impact on differential diagnosis and treatment plan. Now, the work group on culture uh, for DSM-5 headed by Roberto Luis Fernandez at Columbia, and I was part of that 30-person work group, felt the clinicians needed help in gathering the information for the outline for cultural formulation. So we devised a cultural formulation interview, which was pilot tested internationally, uh, field trials, and so on. That's been published. Um, and so there are questions along these areas that follow the outline for cultural formulation, but not in the, in the same order. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so there's a patient version and an informant version that's actually printed in the back of DSM-5 uh, in section three. And then there are the supplementary modules that you can access by Googling supplementary modules DSM-5 that's in your packet that I sent out. And these are deeper dive uh, areas and questions for specific parts of the outline for cultural formulation that you can see here. But the last four um, relate to uh, specific uh, patient populations. So very relevant to your work that I would really advise you to take a look at is this one on school-aged children and adolescents. And, and uh, I, I think I have this, this supplementary module at the end of my talk, if we have time, to go into greater detail about it. Um, now, so this is what the CFI looks like in the DSM-5, as you can see, it's not a, just a list of 16 questions, but rather there's a guide to the interviewer on the left column and instructions and so on. And the first question here is what brings you here today? So hopefully you're asking that question right now, you're, you're already doing the one out of 16. 
And um, I will now go through the 16 questions in the order of the CFI, and they are not the same order as the outline for cultural formulation. The reason being, we thought that uh, that first question was the natural place to start, rather than, can you tell me uh, what is your background or cultural identity? We thought that would not work as well. So, so what brings you here today? Wind illness. Uh, so sometimes uh, people speak about this to their social network. How would you describe your wind illness to them? So throughout this, uh, uh, throughout the CFI uh, problem is caps and brackets because we want to use use we want you to use the patient's words. And then the next two questions relate to cause. Uh, this goes all the way back to Arthur Kleinman's work on explanatory model. Why do you think this is happening to you? And what do you think are the causes of your wind illness? And what do others in your social network say are the causes? So you can see two of the five questions here have that social network uh, aspect, which um, is important. Now, this relates to part B of the outline for cultural formulation. Again, this is all in the handout packet. It's uh, all in section three. Um, and there are, as you can see, there are three subtypes here, cultural syndromes, idioms of distress, explanatory model. So idioms of distress are, are um, discrete, uh, distressing experiences, um, uh, involving the patient's uh, uh, naming of what's happening to them. And the cultural syndromes, if you will, are a clustering of idioms of distress um, in, 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 a, in a cluster. And then it says that we need to um, assess this uh, in reference to the cultural reference group, the norms of the cultural reference group. So that's why we ask the questions about the social network. And then there's this section about coping and help seeking patterns involving professional as well as traditional alternative or complementary sources of care. So this uh, um, uh, involves the, uh, the religious healer, the herbal medicine, the acupuncture. Um, now questions 11 to 15 of the CFI speak to this section. We'll come back to that later. Now, if you go to that glossary of cultural concepts of distress in the appendix, uh, which is in your packet, there are nine examples, nine examples. Um, and uh, so here you see a table where we have on the far left, the name uh, so when you say, you know, ask the patient, what brings you here today? They may say nervios or susto. They may use those terms. And then in the middle, we have which of the three types, subtypes, and these uh, may be related. So nervios, you see in the middle is an idiom of distress. And a talke de nervios at the top is a cultural syndrome in which nervios uh, is one of the aspects of that of that cultural syndrome. And then in the far uh, left, we have the places in the world uh, where we see this. And of course, that's important to us since people come from all over. And the, this book, which I imagine many of you know, if, in, 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 if any of you do not know, I would recommend it, um, is uh, a cautionary tale about, uh, based on a true life story of a Hmong infant, a child who had a grand mal seizure, uh, diagnosed and treated by neurologists in the Central Valley of California from a purely biomedical explanatory model and also uh, treatment of medications. Um, the problem was the family had a supernatural explanatory model and thought this was a shamanic opening and uh, couldn't really understand about the use of medications. There was never a discussion or negotiation, led to uh, medication noncompliance. The uh, 
child had a prolonged grand mal seizure, was in a vegetative state for 20 years, and died uh, about five or six years ago, um, as mentioned in the New York Times. And so this is a situation where we want to avoid, and it's a cautionary tale, and uh, shows the importance of why we need to elicit uh, this information. And moving on to the next two questions of the CFI, are there any kinds of support that make your problem better or stresses that make your uh, wind illness worse? So this relates to part C of the outline. And the first sentence here I think is the critical one. Identify the key stressors and supports in the person's social environment, both local and distant. Uh, and the role of religion, family, and other social networks in providing support. Now, religion and family was explicitly mentioned in the DSM-4. Other social networks was added in DSM-5. Now, uh, and then this is a further elaboration uh, of this uh, section here. Um, now, in under trying to understand or unpack this a little bit, I, I do believe that you can look at the interpersonal relationships uh, along those three domains of religion, family, and social network. That's the local part of the social environment. But the distant part of the social environment could be the social determinants of mental health. Distant meaning, um, more, uh, you know, that um, is a little further away, if you will. Um, and the patients may not be even fully aware of some of these social determinants of mental health. Um, we saw this earlier. And now turning to uh, uh, strengths uh, or supports, we're always looking for ways to support our patients um, and to utilize their, their strengths and supports as part of the recovery model. And by putting on the cultural lens, you may see more things to access to help patients. So Pamela Hayes in her book that I'll reference in a moment uh, has a chapter on these different uh, strengths and supports extended families, religious communities, storytelling, involvement in political or social action groups. We know how important that is these days. And then environmental conditions, such as caring for animals. We know how important that can be for our patients. And in terms of religion and spirituality, the, the supplementary module on that um, is summarized here. And again, I think there are uh, looking at uh, practices, rituals, ceremonies, uh, faith communities, uh, are all ways that we can try to understand how this is helpful to the patients. And then in terms of family, uh, who's in the family, the use of a genogram, extended families in addition to nuclear families, how uh, ethnicity and acculturation can affect uh, a family, uh, family. And this uh, very important book, highly recommended, Ethnicity and Family Therapy, 56 chapters, not only on Japanese families and Vietnamese families, but also Irish families and Italian families and, and, um, and uh, Russian families. So here's the references here. Now moving on to the next three questions uh, on the cultural identity. For you, what are the most important aspects of your background or identity? Um, are there any aspects of your background or identity that make a difference to your wind illness? And then a follow-up question. Now, this all relates to part A, the cultural identity of the individual. This is what we see in DSM-4 with an explicit mention of race, ethnicity, and for immigrants and racial ethnic minorities, the degree of involvement with the traditional culture, culture of origin, and the host or American culture, and language. Now, added in DSM-5, very important, um, is this sentence, which 
uh, explicitly expands the items that we need to think about in terms of cultural identity. And this is not a complete and exclusive list as I'll show you in just a moment. But the idea is we want to get beyond race, ethnicity and beyond language uh, to think about all of these other things. So Pamela Hayes in her book, Addressing Cultural Complexities in Practice, uses the word addressing as an acronym, as you can see uh, there, uh, and each of those letters uh, triggers off a cultural identity variable for us to assess, to think about, uh, but it's not uh, complete because language uh, starts with an L and there's no L in addressing. That's why it's off to the right there. Another diagram that uh, illustrates this are this variety of cultural identity variables, starting with linguistic characteristics uh, to the left and then uh, coming to spirituality over on the far right. You can see that sense of intersectionality and then how does that intersect with the environment? That's that social environment, the stresses and supports, as well as the health beliefs and practices. That's the cultural concepts of distress and the coping and the coping and help seeking patterns. Um, so again, ask, don't assume. Uh, Asian uh, is just an umbrella term. There are many sub-ethnic groups. National origin doesn't define a homogeneous ethnic group. There are 54 distinct ethnic groups in Vietnam. And uh, cultural identity is related to all the other parts of the outline for cultural formulation. And uh, cultural identity can be a source of stress uh, uh, think of it intrapsychically. There could be cultural identity conflict. You know, am I, how much am I Chinese? How much am I an American? Uh, for someone that was uh, my, myself, I, my parents came from China and I was born in San Francisco. So, you know, that's a question I struggled with throughout my life. You know, am I gay? Am I straight? Questioning of my sexual orientation or religious identity. And then how does this play out interpersonally when you have, uh, let's say, the traditionally acculturated Vietnamese parents with limited English proficiency, and we have the adolescent uh, who is a fast assimilator. Uh, and even though they share the same ethnicity of Vietnamese, they have a very different cultural identity and cultural values and that could cause conflict, as well as at the social level. So now moving on to questions 11 to 15, this gets us to the self-coping and the past help seeking. We want to know how people have done that and what have been the barriers to care because they may come up again in your treatment. And here are the take home questions, very important. What kinds of help do you think would be most helpful to you at this time for your wind illness? And are there other kinds of help that you're social network would recommend. So this uh, uh, relates to coming back to part B, that section I mentioned earlier. And we know that uh, patients may go to primary care first for somatic complaints or these other healers before they come to us. And there are many, uh, many uh, methods here that we just need to be aware of. And then the last question of the CFI is this one which just touches on the issue of the clinician-patient relationship. Now, sometimes doctors and patients misunderstand each other because they come from different backgrounds or have different expectations. Have you been concerned about this? Is there anything that we can do to provide you with the care you need? So this touches on the very important part D section. Uh, again, what's in yellow is added in DSM-5. So, Identify differences in the culture, language, social status, cultural identity between the individual clinician that may cause difficulties in communication. So language and communication was added, you know, to make that explicitly uh, uh, important and may influence diagnosis and treatment. Added, added here, experiences of racism and discrimination in the larger society may impede trust. The, so obviously very relevant to what's happening now. And 
effects uh, may be a kind of this misunderstanding of uh, what's cultural, what's psychopathological, and difficulty establishing a therapeutic relationship, which we know is so important in terms of, you know, any basis of working together. So how do you operationalize this? The four steps, four steps. First, you have to start with yourself uh, in terms of your cultural identity and, and your, um, and so on. Secondly, is to compare the cultural, your cultural identity with the cultural identity of the patient. So how do you do this? So a uh, far left column are the cultural identity variables uh, that we've been talking about, age, gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, et cetera. Uh, in the middle, the patient's cultural identity variables um, and then in the far left, uh, right column is your cultural identity variables. And look for the similarities and differences. Um, and, and how does that then, this is step three, how does that affect the therapeutic relationship along these lines, along these uh, variables, which is something we think about all the time. Again, we're just putting on the cultural lens here. Um, and I'm going to get you four examples in just a moment here, um, but uh, dealing with, uh, you know, how do you establish respect and empathy, communication, and how do you elicit symptoms, gather history, dealing with stigma, shame, transference, and counter-transference. And uh, again, these biases can go both ways, clinician bias, but also patient bias towards who they think we are. This is the fourth step. Then, what would help the clinician to provide optimal care? That's the responsiveness piece. See, so sometimes cultural identity matches are critical. I'll give you two examples in a moment. Other times, it's simply knowing more about this area, either yourself or, or searching the literature, getting a cultural consultation, uh, or you know, so on. So let me give you four quick examples. I'm. Uh, I uh, am Chinese, but I only speak English. My Chinese patient comes up to me and starts speaking Cantonese. Well, we have a language difference. This is going to cause a problem in communication. I need to respond by either getting a trained interpreter or referring the person to a Cantonese speaking psychiatrist. I'm a man. The patient's a woman. Seems first interview seems very reluctant to give me any information at the end says well I'd rather see a woman psychiatrist. So what do I do with that do I say well patients treatment resistant passive passive aggressive, you know, or do I ask don't assume they'll tell me more. As it turns out patient says well you know I had a very difficult time with my husband I don't want to get into it and. I just feel much more comfortable speaking to a woman. Okay, well, as we find out, you know, there's been a whole history of sexual abuse, physical abuse, and so on. And having a woman psychiatrist is reassuring for this patient. Third example, I'm a, a Democrat uh, and I voted for Clinton and uh, a man walks in with a red cap that says, make America great again. And he looks at me and he says, well, what country are you from? Well, here we have a political orientation difference. And uh, this is immediately impacting on our relationship. Fourth example, I'm an atheist. I asked the patient, well, what brings you here today? The patient says, well, I've lost my faith in God and God is punishing me for my sins. Well, there is a religious uh, commitment difference. And... Um, if I, and here's where transference, here's where counter-transference can, you know, be a problem. You know, if I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. I could inadvertently be disrespectful of the patient, either by psychopathologizing these ideas or completely neglecting them. You know, I'm not going to even go there. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to ask about it. And the patient may feel uh, unheard and drop out of treatment. Okay, so moving on now to, um, right. And what we talked about right now is just the cultural features of a relationship between patient and the clinician, but also you can talk about this also 
between the trainees and the supervisors and between the supervisors and the patients. Um, right, so these are the sections of the supplementary module for uh, uh, children and adolescents. These are the topic areas. I don't think we have time to, to get into this. Uh, I, I, um, I just ask that you may want to take a look at this uh, to uh, help you with your day-to-day -day work. There's a whole section here on uh, adolescence. And then these are the kinds of the specific questions here um, that are in each of these sections. Age appropriateness, age-related stressors and supports, um, age-related expectations, And then uh, there's this, there's another section uh, uh, that are asked to the parents that I think are important as well. Um, now moving on to the last section, and I, I know we have about 12 minutes left here. Uh, this asks us to summarize all of the previous information and how does this impact on your diagnosis and other clinically relevant issues or problems. And I think that's the V codes. I think that's the social determinants of mental health. And how does this impact on your treatment planning? So bottom line on differential diagnosis, we want it as complete as possible. We want to avoid a misdiagnosis, which can be related to not understanding what's psychopathological, what's uh, cultural, not having an adequate relationship, uh, clinician bias, and so on. So I would ask that you review those culture-related, gender-related diagnostic issue sections as well as thinking about adding V codes that map onto those social determinants of mental health so they can be addressed in the treatment plan. That's the idea, is if it's on the diagnosis, then it has a chance of getting addressed in the treatment plan. If it's not on the diagnosis, it just falls off the map. So in terms of treatment planning, the process of negotiating and managing a treatment plan to maximize adherence and compliance. I dare say we do that every day with every patient. So just put on the cultural lens to see if any of this information may, may be helpful to us to how do we maintain uh, the patient coming back and taking the medication and so on. And from the content point of view, just some quick examples, we know that pharmacokinetics and dynamics are related uh, to uh, race, ethnicity, gender, age. These are all things that we uh, should take into consideration, but also environment and herbal medications. Um, so uh, these are things to think about. Um, and in terms of psychotherapy, my uh, uh, deceased colleague in Asian mental health, Evelyn Lee, and I know there's going to be her uh, lecture, her annual lecture, memorial lecture ne uh, next week or so. Um, she used to say, be the tiger bomb oil at the first interview when treating traditionally acculturated Chinese patients, meaning there is this expectation of some immediate relief on the first interview. If you don't match it, patients feel uh, disappointed, may drop out of treatment. And then we need to think of the various kinds of therapy and for some cultures where there it's more family centric as opposed to individually oriented family, at least the family assessment, family treatment may be helpful. Um, and also in terms of even our usual forms of therapy, supportive CBT or insight oriented, we have now uh, books on culturally responsive CBT, um, you know, uh, and also culture and um, analytic or insight approaches is also written about and talked about. So what cultural modifications in therapy? And again, what are the therapist characteristics that would facilitate or hinder treatment? These are the bottom line questions. In terms of sociocultural, again, think family, spirit, religion, social network, and just to make 
mention of addressing the social determinants of mental health through structural competency, work of Helena Hansen, Jonathan Metzl, uh, very important. Um, just some books to help you uh, here, further learning, the Clinical Manual of Cultural Psychiatry on the outline, the handbook on the CFI. Uh, this is an online training module uh, that's great in terms of the CFI. There's an e-learning program on cultural competence uh, that I recommend. Um, and the Society for the Study of Psychiatry and Culture. There are webinars on the outline for cultural formulation sections uh, there. So we have a few minutes for questions and uh, I can check the uh, chat window and um, people would like to ask questions as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. That was an illuminating talk. I just sent an e uh, chat to everyone. They could send questions to me directly. Um, any comments or questions? Hopefully that'll um, help with the traffic. I'll also send uh, uh, to uh, uh, Samantha for distribution a resource list uh, that I've put together recently uh, of professional organization websites on diversity, inclusion, uh, equity, and anti-racism, as well as uh, uh, book lists on Amazon that I've put together um, and there's one specific book list on children, adolescents, and their families. I think it's, um, I think it's number, um, uh, I think it's number five, but I'll, I'll point that out, okay? There's one specific book list on children, adolescents, and their families, yeah. Thank you. Samantha Yabona will be sending, uh, please send your email to Sam um, if you would like the materials and she'll send them directly to you. Um, and Sam had listed her email address in the chat. So if you can just review that folks, um, you'll see her email there. Um, just reading some comments. Thank you very much for a valuable presentation. Um, very informative presentation regarding the interview process. Um, thank you, Dr. Lou for the great talk. Um, what is the difference between a cultural syndrome and idiom of distress? Well, again, I would, I would, uh, there are technical definitions that, that make that fine distinction. Uh, I, I would just see the idiom of distress, if you will, as like almost like the presenting chief complaint, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, more immediate uh, it's like the name the name of what troubles them, and the cultural syndrome is more of a let's say a formed concept that uh, may be part uh, that we see in 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 that particular culture where there are it's an interrelated web of of uh, different features. Uh, that's a higher level of complexity, if you will. It's, I put it that way. Certainly, there, may, there must be some more questions. We do have four more minutes left. <laughs> I'm monitoring our chat here. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see anything in the chat. People should be ch typing into the chat or speaking up. I don't know. Here we go, we have another comment. Thank you for being a pioneer in this field and also so kind and giving to trainees over the decades. Um, wanted to make a comment about um, understanding a patient's culture to ask about online and social, social media activities as, as this may be a huge part of patients' protective and risk factors. Could you comment on that, Dr. Liu, please? Online activities. Uh, meaning social media, would we mean social media? Yeah, understanding of the patient's culture to ask about online. Yes, yes, media. yes, absolutely. I think, I think this is another aspect here is, uh, yes, I think depending on the, the age of the person and if social media plays a large role in their life, 
uh, in terms of the time they spent on social media and how does that then inform uh, them as to who they are and who they are relating to. And uh, obviously uh, we can see the, you know, in the most extreme forms, how people can gravitate to as extremist groups or hate groups as a whole, you know, th these, are, these are online cultures which then impact the cultural identity of the people participating in the social media. So uh, definitely, uh, depending on the age of the person and their use of social media, this could certainly be an influential uh, part of their cultural identity and their stresses and supports. So you can imagine that. So, um, yeah. We have a couple more minutes. Scanning the chat. I did, someone did um, ping me as well, um, Dr. Liu. Oh, good. Um, is cultural humility just another term for cultural competence or are they specific differences between the two? No, I, my view of this is that cultural humility is a part of cultural competence. I see that as the umbrella term uh, because cultural humility by itself is not enough. Where's the cultural responsiveness uh, that's so important as uh, uh, of cultural competence? But cultural humility, I mean, some people have been talking about cultural humility replacing cultural competence. My view of that is uh, that's insufficient. I, I, in other words, I see cultural humility as necessary for cultural competence, but not sufficient because uh, it's necessary because one has to take the stance of curiosity, asking, not assuming, um, and um, getting consultation, et cetera, as opposed to, you know, reading a chapter and knowing and, and then acting as if you know exactly what to do. Um, uh, but it's not sufficient uh, for cultural competence, right? There's one more question, um, which might lead to going over a time potentially, but I will ask it. Um, I so appreciate it. Dr. Liu brought up the work on social determinants of mental health in the book um, by Drs. Compton and Shim. This is related to structural determinants, and I'm curious, what is your view on the relationship between structural and cultural competence? Yes, a very important question, very important. And uh, basically, uh, over the last five years or so, this idea of, co of structural competency has come forth with, uh, with, the, with the idea of structural competency as methods of treating or addressing the social determinants of mental health. In fact, um, Jonathan Met uh, Helena Hansen and Jonathan Metzel have a book that's right here on my shelf entitled Structural Competency in, Medical, in Mental Health and Medicine. Okay, and they, and they uh, on the cover it says, uh, kind of approaches to addressing the social determinants of health. Uh, so, um, and so, so some people have advocated to let's just focus on structural competency. I mean, cultural competency is just off over here. And uh, my view of this uh, really is we need to try to bring this together. Uh, we really need to bring it together. And that's what I've tried to do in my presentation um, is to, if you look at the outline, um, you can interpret part C, where you talk about the stressors and supports. You can include the structural determinants of mental health there as local or distant social environmental factors that the person is, is dealing with. And so I would advocate to bringing these two together because both are important. We can't get into an either or battle, which is more important than the other, or does structural competency replace cultural competency? I, I think these are useless battles. We really need to, you know, kind of look for the, the model that brings them together. And I think we can do that here by 
Part C, stressors and supports. Think of social determinants of mental health for your differential diagnosis. Uh, think of the V codes of adding them on and then addressing them in the treatment plan. That's the structural competency part. I didn't have time to get into that, but that's the structural competency part. That should be part of the treatment plan. Can you imagine that? Uh, structural competency should be thought of in every treatment plan to think about how that can be incorporated. Now that could be done either at the clinician level, you know, th thinking about, you know, you know, looking at housing, food insecurity, discrimination, you know, part including that in the treatment plan at the clinical level with the patient in front of you. And, and, and also there is the policy level. Um, that's 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 another that's another level of abstraction to work on okay but that's for the policy makers and advocacy groups and so on but the, at the clinical level we can bring structural competency into individual patient care that can make a difference so i do see this as a way of bringing these together and i would urge that everybody uh, think about that as a possibility to help in uh, optimal treatment planning. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. And we have um, the uh, double pleasure of having Dr. Helena Hansen um, join us for this series in November. So this is wonderful. It's perfect. Great, um, great. Working yes. in synergy here. Um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very, much. very, very much. Um, and thank you, everyone um, who stayed and um, totally understand for folks who had to leave right on time. Thank you so much for your time. Everyone have a great afternoon. Take good care. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Dr. Liu. Um, Dr. Liu, I just want to yes. say um, I have got over 50 requests of people asking you to send that list um, of recommendations. And resources, and yes, yes, I'll resources. send I'll send that to you, yeah. Yeah, so um, I've just yeah, got- and then, and then send it out to everybody, just send it out to everybody, yeah, okay. I'll we'll do, I'll put it, I'll okay. put it out for everybody, so thank and, you. And, you. and you got the handout packet, right? You can send that out, good. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, thank yeah. you very thank much. Thank you so yeah. much, everybody, have a good one. Thank you.